to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ but thanks be to god who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. Welcome to our study of 1 Corinthians 15 and 16 as we deal with the marvelous subjects of the resurrection and Christian giving. The resurrection is the heart and core of the gospel. Paul makes this known to us in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 3 as he ties the gospel of Christ directly into the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Oftentimes Christians sing the song, Up from the grave he arose. And how encouraging it is to know that this life is not all there is. When we die, when our bodies are buried in the grave, that that is not the end. We have the hope, the promise of the resurrection. Now, notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 1. Here are his words on the resurrection. Moreover, brethren, Paul says, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand. Well, what is that gospel? By which you're saved, if you hold fast the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Here you have Jesus' death. The Gospel is the death of Christ. Jesus died for sin, 1 Peter 2, verse 24, so that we don't have to die in sin, Ezekiel 18 and verse 4. Jesus was buried in the grave, Matthew 27 teaches us, and Jesus, we meet Him in that burial in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, when we're buried with Him in baptism. But the Gospel doesn't end there. It's not just the death of Christ and the death of Christians to sin. It's not just Christ's burial in the grave and our burial in baptism. The core, the heart of the Gospel is the fact that Jesus arose out of the grave and that we too must rise and walk in newness of life. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Friend, without the resurrection, the Gospel has no hope. Oh, it's great to know that we died from sin. It's great to know that we're buried, we're united with Christ. Well, what does all that mean if this life is all there is? The fact is, this life is not all there is. We have the promise of the resurrection. Jesus said this in John 11, verse 25. Jesus said to the sister of Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, Jesus said, He shall live. Jesus said, You'll never really die if you believe in Me because we have the promise of eternal life. Jesus said this in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Jesus said, There's a time coming when all who are in the grave shall come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of eternal life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of eternal death. There is a resurrection and all people will partake in it the way we live our life now determines if it'll be a resurrection to eternal life or a resurrection to eternal death. Now, Paul in this chapter is going to show that some were saying evidently that the resurrection is not true. It was not part of the gospel. They were trying to show Corinthian Christians that wasn't right. And Paul makes the point, kind of using a negative, by showing if it's not true, well, here's what else is not true. Now, notice some of the things he says. Paul says, in about verses 6 all the way through about verses 23, if there is no re resurrection, then our preaching's in vain. Preaching the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, is worthless. If Christ wasn't raised from the dead, what good is it to tell men Jesus died from their sin if they were going to remain in the grave forever? He says, not only is preaching in vain, but our faith is empty. What kind of faith in God is it to say, believe in Jesus and you'll have eternal life if we're not raised out of the grave. That's not faith. Our faith is not based on fact if the resurrection is not true. Paul then says not only is our faith empty, but we're false witnesses or we're liars. If we are preaching Jesus and saying what God says in the Bible and the resurrection is not a fact, then Christianity is a farce and a lie. We better pack it up and go home. 
That's how serious this matter is. If there is no resurrection, then we're still in sin. Now, how are those two correlated? Well, if there's no resurrection, guess what else there also is not? There's no burial and there's no death. For all three are directly tied together. You cannot have one without the other. Christ died, He was buried, and He was resurrected. To say there's no resurrection is also to deny the plain facts that Jesus did not live and He did not die. And so when we say the resurrection is not true, we say we're still in sin, and that's a very serious matter. Paul then says if there's no resurrection, then dead people simply perish, they cease to exist. They're like Rover, they're dead all over. That's it. This life is all you have. The grave is the hope. And my friend, what kind of hope is that? That's why Paul next says our only hope is this life. You know, my friends, if there's no resurrection, we may as well adopt the opinion, the ideology of the Epicureans. We need to eat, drink, and be merry, and live it up in this life, for that's all we have. But above that, do you know if there's no resurrection, Christians are the most pitiable of all people? My friend, my life is built on and the hope is built on the fact that one day, and every Christian's is, there is going to be a resurrection. This life is not all there is. I'm serving God in the here and now because I love Him and in view of the hope of eternal life of the resurrection. If that's not true, how pitiable we are of all people. We've lived our life in view of that. But Paul is going to make the point abundantly clear that there is a resurrection and there is abundant proof. This is not something that happened in a corner somewhere. In 1 Corinthians 15 verses 4 and 5, Paul is going to show in the verses following that up to 500 people saw Jesus resurrected at once. It is a fact that Christ did die, that He lived, that He died, and yes, that He was buried and He came up out of the grave. In John chapter 20, you have the example of Thomas. Thomas says, you know, I, I see you, but I'm not going to believe that you're the Lord until I reach my hand in your side and so I see the handprints in your hand. And he did that. And do you remember what Thomas said? John 20 verse 28, My Lord and my God, the evidence overwhelmingly teaches us the resurrection is true. Now, that being the case, Paul is going to move in showing some things that will happen at the resurrection. One of those things is that at the resurrection, Christ is going to deliver the kingdom to God. I want you to notice 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24. Look at what Paul here says. Then comes the end. When Christ returns, when the resurrection occurs, then comes the end. When He delivers the kingdom to the Father, when He puts an end to all rule, all authority, and all power. When Christ returns, when the resurrection occurs, the two events being united, God at that time, or Christ at that time, is going to deliver the kingdom to the Father. Well, someone says, well, what is the kingdom? What's being discussed here? Jesus promised He would establish His kingdom. Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, He said, Assuredly to His disciples, there are some of you standing here who will not taste death until you see the kingdom present with power. We learn from Colossians 1 verse 13 that some in the first century were transferred into that kingdom. It was a present reality then. Well, what is the kingdom? In Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19, Jesus said, I say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock, on the fact that I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God, I'll build my church. And then he said this, and I'm going to give to you the keys of the kingdom. What is the kingdom? The kingdom is the church. At the resurrection, God, Christ, is going to deliver the church to the Father. Now, why is that significant? Here's why that's so significant. If the church is the called out, and at the resurrection, Christ is going to deliver those people, the church, to God, then friend, you must realize it is essential to be in the kingdom when Christ comes or to have lived your life faithfully in the kingdom and died in it so that you can be with God forever. Only those in the kingdom. What kingdom? The church Jesus died for. The one church you read about in the Bible, Ephesians 4 and verse 4, the church of Christ that we see in the New Testament. Those are the people who are going to be united one day with God. And so my friend, I must make sure that I'm in the kingdom, and the only way to get into the kingdom is to be baptized into God's family. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 says, By one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. In Acts chapter 2, verses 38 through 47, when they repented and were baptized for the remission of their sins, the Lord God added them to His church, His kingdom. And so we must be in that at the resurrection or live our life faithful to it so we can have the resurrection to eternal life. Well, what else will happen at the resurrection? Not only will the kingdom be delivered to God, but the last enemy is going to be defeated. Well, what is that last enemy? Well, I know it's not the devil. 
For the devil was defeated, ultimately given that death blow at the death of Christ on the cross. The Bible says in Hebrews 2 verse 14, He, Jesus, through death, conquered him who had the power of death, which is the devil. And so the devil was ultimately defeated. He's already has his final end in destruction, according to Revelation 20, verses uh, 12 through 15 following. But what is this last enemy? If it's not the devil, what is it? The last enemy is death itself. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 25 and 26. Here's what the scripture says. For he, Jesus, must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Paul's later going to say in this chapter, because of the resurrection, because Christians have arisen, oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The last enemy, death, Jesus destroyed by dying on the cross, by arising out of the grave. And friend, when Jesus arose, Death was completely conquered, and when He comes again, death will be ultimately conquered at the resurrection of all people, and death will be no more. You see, the beautiful picture here is that Christians, although we may die in this life, death will not always have a hold over us. Christ will come back. We will be raised out of the grave, and death will be no more. Revelation 14, verse 13, this is why the Christian's death is a blessing. Blessed are those who die in the Lord because they're going to be raised one day. This is why it's precious in the sight of God when one of His saints dies. Psalm 116 and verse 15. But notice what the resurrection should cause us to do. Yes, it's true that the last enemy, death, will be defeated at the resurrection. But you know, in view of that, the resurrection of Christ ought to cause me to die every day. Notice the words of 1 Corinthians 15 verse 31. You know, it's just a very simple statement. Paul says this, I die daily. Friend, because of the fact that one day we're going to be resurrected, death is going to be defeated, I've got to die to self daily so that I can live for God. If I'm going to partake in the resurrection, there has to be a death in the here and now in a spiritual sense. And that is my death to sin so that I can live for God. In Luke 9 verse 23, Jesus said, If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. We've got to deny, put self to death, so that we can be preparing for the great day of Christ's coming. In Romans 6 and verse 4, after Christians have been buried with Christ, the Bible says they're raised to walk in newness of life. We die to sin, we're born again, John 3 verse 5, and we get a second chance. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. And so yes, this type of view, this type of teaching in the Bible, I should say to myself, in view of the fact, that one day I'm going to live with God forever, that one day Christ is going to return, that those whom I love, that if I live faithful, I'll come up out of the grave to be with the Lord in the air. First Thessalonians 4, verse 13 following. I ought to be motivated every day to die to self, to live for Jesus. Now, friend, let's be frank. This is the point I believe that many people miss. Many people want to live for Jesus and live for themselves. Friend, if you're going to be part of the resurrection, if you're going to have the hope of heaven, you've got to die to self every day. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 19 and 20 teaches us that we're not our own. We're bought at a price. Therefore, we've got to glorify God in our body and our spirit, which are His. Paul taught us in Galatians 2 verse 20, we've got to be crucified with Christ. We've got to give our lives as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. And so Christianity is not about me and God. Christianity is about me dying to self so that I can live for God. And we've got to make sure that we've done that so that we can serve the Lord properly. Now, one of the ways in which we die to self is that we get rid of evil influences in our life which might keep us from being faithful. Another very simple, very short statement. Paul makes this in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33. Evil companions corrupt good morals. You cannot die to self and run around with children of the devil who are going to cause you to do ungodly things. Evil companions corrupt good morals. If you run with someone who's living a life that's not right, they're going to influence you. They're, they may cause you to do evil things. Here's what the Bible says. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22, we're to abstain from every appearance of evil. We're not even to get around something that looks like it's evil. And so surely, if we're going to be a part of the resurrection, 
we're going to have to cut some ties in our lives. One of the hardest things for people to do when they repent is to stop running around with that group that they've always run around with. If you, listen now, if you want to change your life, here's one of the things you're going to have to do. If you decide in your life, I'm going to repent, I'm going to do what's right, I'm going to live for Jesus, I can guarantee you, you're going to have to stop running around with some of the people you've run around with. People who influence you. Now, I'm not saying you don't want to teach them the gospel. You do. You want to try to influence them for good. You want to teach them the gospel. But friend, you cannot run around with people like that and expect them not to have some kind of influence on you. And so be careful who you associate with. Now, again, all of this is in view of the wonderful fact of death being defeated and what's going to happen on that final day. What is going to happen when the Lord comes back, when we rise out of the grave? What's that going to be like? What's going to happen? Well, we may not know all the details of it. We may not understand the intricacies, but here's what we do know. Look at the beautiful words of 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50 following. The Bible says, Now this I say, brethren, the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruption has put on incorruption, when this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Friend, when Christ comes back, we learn that the kingdom is not flesh and blood. There is no marriage or being given marriage in the kingdom, according to Mark chapter 12 kingdom is incorruptible. Therefore, we must be incorruptible. We are no longer going to have this mortal, physical, fleshly body. We're not all going to sleep, meaning that we're not all going to die. When Jesus comes back, there will be Christians alive, and we're all going to be changed. Now, what all does that mean? Friend, I don't have all the answers to that. All I know is that we're going to be like Jesus. Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21, Our citizenship's in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus, who would change our mortal body, and to be one like His body. 1 John 3 implies that our body is somehow going to be changed like that of the Savior. We're still somehow going to be rec able to recognize and notice one another, but there's going to be a change from corruptible to incorruptible, from mortal to immortal, so that we no longer perish or have to face death. And in view of that, regardless if I understand the intricacies of that or not, what a wonderful thing that is to know there'll be no more death, there'll be no more sorrow, there'll be no more sores or pain. All of that will have vanished away. And in view of that, Here's what Paul says in verse 57. It's almost a, a valiant victory cry. Thanks be to God because of the resurrection. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Victory of what? Over death through our Lord Jesus Christ. As a Christian, as a child of God, although I may perish physically, I will not, if I remain faithful, die spiritually. Why? Because he that, is us, he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. 1 John 4 verse 4. Jesus, the Bible says in 1 John 5 verse 4, our faith that we have in him is the victory that we have. The trust, the obedient faith in Jesus gives us victory over death. Remember, Jesus has already overcome death. He's already defeated Satan. Hebrews 2 verse 14. All that we need to do is remain faithful. Now, that leads right into verse 58. Notice what Paul says. In view of the fact that Christ has already won the battle, we can be victors, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not vain in the Lord. And so, yes, we must be faithful to Jesus every day. Now, not only... Does Paul discuss the resurrection in chapter 15? But he also leads right into Christians and their giving. And it's a, there's a direct correlation there, I believe. If we truly understand what Christ has done for us, all that He gave, the fact that He is raised, why well, we'd want to give of our means and of ourselves unto the Lord. Notice what Paul says to the churches in Corinth and the surrounding areas about giving. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 1, Paul has these words to say. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. 
on the first day of every New American Standard Version reads, every week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that be no collections when I come. Giving, first of all, we need to understand, is a command of God. As I commanded churches in Galatia, you must do also. John 14, verse 15, if we love the Lord, we keep His commandments. Giving is on the first day of the week. Verse 2, when you come together on the first day of the week, like the language of Acts chapter 20, verse 7. But here's what's interesting. The New American Standard Bible, the English Standard, those that base their evidence on more textual evidence, the NU text, have the word every in the original. And that's the idea. We're to give on every first day of the week. Now, if that's true, why are we coming together on the first day of the week to begin with? Acts 20, verse 7, they gathered on the first day of the week to break bread. And so this passage also helps us to understand not only that we give every first day of the week, but we also are to partake the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. Now, Christians today don't tithe. Tithing is something you find under the Old Testament. You may hear a lot of people say today, well, we need to tithe, we need to give a tenth. No, you don't find that in the New Testament. The Old Law has been nailed to the cross. Colossians 2 verses 14 and 15 and what we find is that we give as we've been prospered, as God has blessed us above and beyond what we need to provide our necessities. That's how we're to give. Sometimes we see examples of people who even gave beyond their means. You think about the poor widow. Luke 21 verses 1 and 2 here's a woman who had two mites. A lot of people are passing by. They're putting a lot of money in. Everybody's seeing it and noticing it. One little poor widow walks by and you hear this noise. Clank clank. Two small coins go in the pot. You know what Jesus said? She gave more than all because she gave out of her poverty. She gave all that she had. And so here's a woman who didn't just give as she prospered. She gave everything to God. That teaches us that, you know, God ought to come first in our giving. Malachi 3 verse 6, the question is asked, will a man rob God? You know what? A lot of people do rob God today because they don't put God first in their giving. If I'm to seek first the kingdom, Matthew 6, verse 33, and the kingdom is the church, Matthew 16, 18, and 19, then the first thing I ought to think about with my finances is, what do I need to give to God? But sometimes that's the last thing. Giving, of course, had a specific purpose in the context. It was used to help those in need and especially more importantly to reach those who were lost and outside of the body of Christ. And so Paul teaches Christians you need to focus on giving to God, giving your best, giving as you, as you prospered. And this is a command as well as for us today. But I want you to notice something else Paul says to these Corinthian Christians as he begins to bring this book to a close. Notice what he says to them in verse 13. Paul says, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. If Christians are going to endure to the end to be saved, they've got to be watchful. Now, friend, we need to be watchful today because I can assure you the devil is on the lookout, is watching, trying to find ways to get into our life and cause us to be lost. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, he walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. So I need to be on the lookout for sin in my life, for ways Satan might get in, and especially for opportunities to reach out to people. I need to stand firm in the faith. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, without faith, you can't please God. Well, what is faith? Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17, it's obedient trust in God. You know what? Many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Acts chapter 6 verse 7, I need to stand firm in the doctrine, in the teaching, in the life that Jesus has set before me. And so we're to be watchful, stand firm in the faith. And the King James uses the version, the idea of we need to quit acting like men or we need to act like men. The idea is that we need to have bravery, we need to have courage, quit ye like men, act like men, be strong, be brave. The idea is found in Joshua 1 verses 5 through 9 where God, as Moses, is there a change, as there's a change between leadership of Moses and Joshua, God is now going to say to Joshua, act like a man. Be brave, be strong, be courageous. There's going to be trouble. There's going to be difficulty. Things are going to challenge you, but you've got to stand up to the call and live your life for God. And all of that, of course, the love that we have for God and for others ought to be the motivating factor in all that we do. We're to preach the truth in love. Ephesians 4 and verse 15. We're to let brotherly love continue. Hebrews 13 and verse 1. And so, friend, we ask you today, in view of the fact that Christ died for your sin and in view of the fact that He was buried in the grave and the fact that not only did He stay in the grave but 
He arose out of that grave after three days. My friend, shouldn't you change your life so that you can live with the hope of that every day? What a wonderful hope it is to know that my family, my friends, those who have been faithful to the Lord, the grave is not the end. The grave, Sheol, Hades has been defeated. And Christians can rise up out of that. But only Christians have the resurrection to eternal life. Are you sure today that you have that hope? Have you fully given yourself to the Lord and His cause? If not, you can do so very simply today by obeying the will of God. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a part of that group that's one day going to be caught up together with the Lord? Friend, it means that you've got to obey the will of God. You need to hear God's Word, Romans 10 verse 17. Having heard that Word, you need to believe that Jesus is the only way to obtain part of the resurrection and eternal life. The Bible says in John 8, verse 24, Jesus said, unless you believe, Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. Having believed, you also must be willing to repent. The Bible teaches in Luke 13, verse 3, Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise cherish. You've got to change your life. Stop doing some of the things that maybe you've done in the past that are evil and start doing that which is right. And you've got to confess the name of Jesus. Jesus Himself said, unless you confess me before men, I'm not going to confess you before the Father. Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33. And friend, the resurrection is so deeply tied to God's teaching on baptism that the two are inseparable. Remember Romans 6 verses 1 through 4? We die to sin just as Christ died for sin. We are buried with Him in baptism just as Christ was buried in the grave. And we rise out of the watery grave of baptism to live in newness of life with the hope of the resurrection. Ask yourself this, can you really have the hope of the resurrection if you've never been buried with Christ for the remission of your sins. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 teaches it's essential to salvation. And so yes, the, the teaching of God on the resurrection is such a powerful, motivating teaching that this old shell of the body, this life we live now, it's only temporary, it's fleeting, but there's something so much better, something so much grander and how each of us ought to be motivated every day. I want to live my life for Jesus. I, I want to serve Him to the best of my ability because of the hope of the resurrection. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned and about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.